It was an engaging meeting of minds yesterday in Abuja, Nigeria's capital. At the 18th edition of the Daily Trust Dialogue, where critical leaders of thought from across the nation spoke extensively on several issues perceived to be the major challenges to unity and development. It was an exclusive roll call that included, among others, immediate former president Dr. Goodluck Jonathan, elder statesman Chief Ayo Adebanjo, former president of Arnese Ndigo, and former minister of information Chief John Nyanwodo, and professor Atahiru Jega, a former chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission and member of the People's Redemption Party, PRP. We now have the pleasure of having with us this morning Professor Atahiru Jega on the program. Welcome to the program, Professor Jega. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rubian, for having me on your program. Thank you very much, Prof, for joining us. Well, quickly, uh, you have argued consistently, and you did so again yesterday, that restructuring is necessary. But that restructuring on its own is not a sufficient condition that we need to have good governance, uh, we need to have good leaders, we need to have justice, equity, values of equality. Now, which comes first? I mean, isn't restructuring itself uh, a precondition for ensuring good governance, equality, equity, stability, as proposed uh, by many of those who are arguing for restructuring? Um, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rubian. You've asked a very uh, important question. There is no doubt that in a federal system like the one that we have in Nigeria, um, efforts have to be made to ensure <clears throat> that power, resources, and authority are appropriately shared between the national and the subordinate governments, which in our present context in Nigeria is between the federal and the state governments. Um, but sharing authority, power, and resources has to be predicated on equity, on justice, on equality of opportunity. And these can only be driven by good leadership, in a process of good governance. So really, it's not an either or. They have to be combined, and they have to go together. But the key thing is that the Nigerian federal arrangement has been characterized by imbalance and, uh, regrettably, by a concentration of power and the resources in the federal government. Uh, and it is very, very important that we address this because it has been generating tension. Uh, federalism, ob the key objective is to manage diversity, to ensure peaceful coexistence as a precondition for national progress and socioeconomic development. And in Nigeria, all these are undermined and obstructed by the perceptions of inequity because of the concentration of power and resources in the federal government and because of poor governance uh, in the way in which uh, this diversity is managed. So to your question, I will say that um, clearly we have to address the structural imbalance and uh, the, the inequity in the sharing of power and the resources, but it can only succeed if it is combined with good democratic governance. Professor, I'd like to um, reference um, one of your views on what it will take to um, implement re very, very good um, restructuring. And that's one of you commenting on basically having to revisit the independence and republican um, conventions and constitutions of 1960 to 1966. How feasible is that? And is, is that just one of the ways in which to achieve that? Or how much broader can we speak and expatiate on that? Uh, thank you very much, Abi. I, 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 I am one of those who think that history teaches us lessons, but in order to make progress, we need not go back in history. So I think any suggestion uh, as to going back to the 1960 or 1963 constitutions 
uh, really is a pipe dream and is unrealistic. There are a lot of lessons we can learn. And certainly, if we review that history of the past, we could see that the democratic arrangement in Nigeria was better managed than uh, it is uh, currently. And also the lesson is how can we uh, 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 ensure that we introduce substantive reforms of restructuring that can uh, ensure that we manage our diversity much, much better than those uh, who operated under the 1960 and 1963 constitutions were able to do. So the idea of let's go back uh, to what it was in 1963, I think it's, it's, it's unrealistic. Uh, but there are lessons we can learn from that, which we can combine with the best practices of the management of diversity in other federal systems in the world. And that is, for me, the pathway forward in terms of how we can improve our present federal arrangement and make it more equitable and be able to generate a sense of belonging for all Nigerians as a citizen of a country that has very vast potential for progress and development. What are those lessons that we can learn from that constitution? Because a lot of people will argue resource control was prominent on that constitution. In fact, there were certain percentage threshold that the various region paid for each mineral resource in their region to the federal post. But now it's different. The federal shares to people. And at this, there's still a lot of corruption on the federal level. So what are the lessons we can learn from that constitution? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rufai. I, I think uh, you have identified the lessons in your question. Uh, the key lesson is that we have to ensure equity and we have to strive to ensure unity in diversity. Uh, Subnational governments uh, need to have relative autonomy in the way in which they generate their resources and in the way in which they manage their resources. And obviously, there are lessons to learn from the way in which resources are generated and are shared in the uh, First Republic, uh, uh, and, and uh, those lessons need to be factored into how we move forward. Uh, in improving our own federal uh, system. You know, but the notion of resource control, uh, really it's, 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 it's uh, and uh, what I can, uh, I won't say abnormal, but, but really it's something that uh, connotes something totally different from the uh, traditional and good practice uh, notion of sharing uh, on the basis of equity justice and the equality of opportunity. You know, so this uh, uh, extremist notion of every state in the federation or every region should uh, control all its resources was not what happened in the 1960 and 63 uh, 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 constitutions, you know, but there were opportunities for the regions at that time to have substantial resources from the revenues that they generate from within uh, their own territories, uh, which enabled them uh, to be able to chart a course of development for those who reside in their regions. So I think we need to, uh, in this discussion of how to move forward in this country, uh, choose better concepts than those that create more division and more uh, 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 controversy uh, in our discourses. So the issue of resource control, as it has been espoused and championed and promoted, uh, uh, really is not what happened uh, under the 1960-63 uh, constitutions. And, and it's very, very important that we recognize this. And that is why, as we try to improve our federal arrangement and manage our diversity uh, better, it is uh, important that we put aside brinkmanship and uh, 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 pandering uh, to ethno-regional or religious uh, sentiments. You know, these are practical matters that can be addressed practically 
and scientifically in terms of how we can ensure equity in the distribution of resources uh, uh, in uh, our present federal arrangement. Obviously, there are inequities. There are inequities, and we must uh, ensure that we address them. Two things are significant in the management of uh, power and the resources in a federal uh, system. First and foremost, uh, uh, obviously, is to ensure relative autonomy uh, of the, uh, you, what we can call uh, uh, the federating units. Uh, but uh, while we will push for that economy, um, I mean uh, autonomy, uh, relative autonomy, but we must also insist on balanced development. You know, because you can't have a federal system uh, in which there is uh, unequal and unbalanced development. It, it can also generate its own consequences. So the good practice in all federal uh, systems that have become models in this world uh, is balancing uh, equity and relative autonomy uh, with the necessity of balanced uh, development. So I will avoid speaking about resource control because it has its own political and uh, controversial connotations, but I will insist that there must be justice, there must be fairness in the ways in which we distribute uh, resources uh, that are generated from each of the component units uh, of the Federation. Well, Prof, uh, we'll go on break uh, shortly, but before we go on break, let me pose this question to you. One of your major arguments in your presentation at the uh, Daily Trust uh, Dialogue yesterday was that the major challenge of restructuring uh, is uh, doing it without upsetting the apple cart. Now, is that really possible? Mm -hmm. Because you argued against dismantling the structure, the state structure as it is, you say it will create majorities and minorities and create new problems of its own. But I see a contradiction in your argument because you then went further to say, look, we need to devolve powers. We need to reduce the powers of the federal government. Uh, we need to even create below the local government areas uh, development areas. Isn't this uh, dismantling the structure and, you know, upsetting the apple cart? I like, need you to clarify uh, what I see as a contradiction in your argument. But we'll take a, a short commercial break now. When we return, uh, we'll come back to you. Please stay with us, Professor Jega. Welcome back to The Morning Show. Here on the Arise News Channel, our guest is still Professor Atahiru Jega, former chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission and a member of the People's Redemption Party, uh, PRP. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jagar, for staying with us. Well, the question I posed before we went on break, how do you restructure without upsetting the apple cart, considering the fact that restructuring is supposed to be revolutionary? Well, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ruben. Um, I don't think there is any contradiction in uh, uh, what I uh, said or discussed in my paper, and uh, if there is a perception of that uh, contradiction, I hope what I will say now will help clarify it. Um, what I meant by the apple cart is Nigeria as an entity, and what will upset trying to improve upon the federal arrangement is the mobilization of ethnic, religious, and uh, other uh, irredentist uh, tendencies. Um, so that's why I said the challenge of improving this federal arrangement through some form of restructuring is the challenge of ensuring that all these variables which are being mobilized in the politics of restructuring do not actually end up creating so much division such that Nigeria, which is the apple cart, is destroyed. You know, and the whole objective will be, therefore, be lost. So that was what I meant. So, and uh, the best way to do this is obviously uh, not in the revolutionary destructive sense, but what I have argued to be incremental positive changes. You know, 
Things have been so bad, I keep saying this, uh, and in fact, it's something that applies to many sectors uh, of our country. Things have been so bad for so long, particularly on the issue of imbalance and inequities in our federal arrangement, that it would require careful planning, systematic planning, and a time frame within which to address this. You know, uh, and, and a, a revolutionary, destructive uh, approach in, term, in, 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 in the sense of we have to do everything at the same time. Well, prof, really would be counterproductive. Prof, and uh, the little history we have of trying to do wholesale constitutional amendments uh, has shown that it doesn't work. Well, prof, but you can prioritize. Prof, and you can say within a reasonable time frame, we will do this and this, you know, consolidate it and then move on to something else. Well, Prof, so, we'll so talk a really lot more. that is what I meant by, by yes. I get your point. But we'll talk a lot more about the time frame uh, that you, you talked about in your paper and mm. the challenges that that may uh, pose mm. because you are proposing mm. from uh, 2021 to about, uh, is it 2027? But let's take some of the contributions at that uh, forum, Daily Trust uh, uh, Dialogue uh, yesterday. And then we'll come back and the conversation will continue. We have this video from that event. Speaking in Abuja at a national dialogue on restructuring hosted by Daily Trust newspaper, former President Goodluck Jonathan says Nigerians need to restructure their minds on national issues as previous efforts to restructure the country administratively from the three regions to four and then from 12 to 19 and the current 36 states is yet to resolve political agitations. Jonathan, while addressing the town hall meeting, which includes other speakers like former national chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, Professor Atahiru Jaga, and former Ohanezi Ndigbo leader and ex-information minister, John Nwodu, says too much emphasis on divisive politics has greatly affected Nigerians' unity. As the country, we have our peculiar challenges, and we should devise means of solving them. But we should not continue to vent our spleen on the amalgamation. As Shakespeare in Julius Caesar said, the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. The restructuring debate has been on for some time, with many Nigerians, groups, and ethnic nationalities seeking a return to the pre-independence regional system of government, while others seek more state, devolution of powers, and fiscal federalism, among other demands. While former Minister John Wodu and Afeni Fere Chieftain Ayo Adebanjo wants the 1999 constitution to be discarded, and all demands met urgently. Others like Professor Atahiru Jaga are canvassing incremental positive changes that will see the country embarking on major constitutional reforms every four years. 49 people elected, I mean, selected to write a constitution, wrote a constitution. 40 people in the Supreme Military Council promulgated a constitution for us. Under General Bubaka, the government in which I sat, I was in the executive council. I never saw the draft constitution. And I was minister of information. It was my responsibility to publicize it to the country. On the day of swearing in of Obasanjo, we didn't have a copy of the constitution. I didn't know who was printing it. And my ministry was supposed to pay for the printing. And Obasanjo was sworn on a constitution that had not been read by anybody. And the National Assembly could not be constituted until four days after he swore in it because there was no clean copy of the Constitution. You cannot build on quicksand. And the country cannot live on falsehood. There are serious technical problems of the definition of what are nationalities in Nigeria. Secondly, even if we assume that yes, there are ethnic groups and the Igbos, Yorubas, Hausa or Hausa Fulani are ethnic groups, how do you choose those to go into that conference that you are proposing. Representation for constitution making are usually, in fact, invariably territorial, not ethnic. So we will be trying to move from one problem and run into another, you know, if, if we think that 
uh, 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 the ethnic goal will be the foundation of addressing what you perceive to be a quicksand. The fear by some groups that northern political leaders are opposed to restructuring was also denounced by a spokesman of the Northern Elders Forum, Akim Baba Ahmed, who insists that the current political structure of Nigeria needs total overhauling, but that the North will not be blackmailed into taking hasty decisions. We're looking at the incremental, incremental option. If there are things we can do, between now and 2023, because it is absolutely essential that we commence the restructuring before 2023. Otherwise, restructuring will become a hostage of the competition for elections in 2023. If we don't restructure now, it will become an election issue. Election issue. Parts of the country will say, either you give us the presidency or we don't restructure, and then it becomes a hostage. It's too important to be made a hostage of petty politics. Many families are in deep distress. Young people can't find a job. You can't build an industry. We're talking of agriculture. It's very hard to start a large farm. You need money from the bank. You can't find the collateral. So we have children and grandchildren, young people, literally walking around in despair. Suggestions and solutions have been proffered here at this event on restructuring. But the question will be whether the legislative and executive arm of government will be willing to embark on those reforms tabled by the speakers. Arise News. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Uh, that was the video from the Daily Trust uh, Dialogue, uh, 18th edition of it yesterday in Abuja. And we have Professor Atairo Jaga still with us. He was uh, at that event and he was one of the uh, major speakers. Professor Jega, thank you for staying with us. Abby will take the next question. I'm sure she's uh, waiting, <laughs> waiting to you. ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Jega, still on this topic, which, is, which I find extremely interesting. Um, let's talk about the benefits in relation to the costs that could possibly be attached to um, an execution of the sort for proponents, of course, of, of restructuring. Um, I would imagine that it, it's not going to be just a, a logistical nightmare, given the, the, the complex um, diversity of Nigeria. But, but then also, is that a priority for us? Um, uh, well, if I understand your question uh, correctly, um, uh, there are tremendous benefits of making serious effort to pursue some form of restructuring, particularly what I consider to be the incremental positive changes to improve the management of diversity and create more sense of belonging for Nigerian citizens between now and 2023 and then have other things that can also uh, consolidate what has been done during this period between 2023 and 2027. Uh, and of course, the benefits will be enormous. Uh, one of the key benefits is that uh, 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 unity of, in diversity is very, very difficult uh, to, to have. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the overriding objective uh, is to have peaceful coexistence. Because if there is perpetual instability in a federal system, then obviously it will obstruct and undermine uh, socioeconomic development. Uh, and uh, in fact, it can result in perpetual conflict and violence that are destructive of the uh, economic potentials and the other potentials of a country. So restructuring uh, to mitigate this uh, sense of marginalization and uh, perceptions of inequity and the injustices in the ways in which our diversity is managed will definitely go a long way to improve the environment for socioeconomic development uh, uh, in fact, sustainable socioeconomic development in our country, uh, uh, which we all uh, desire. Uh, it also, I believe, would uh, uh, ensure that our subnational governmental units, whether they are the states or under the states, the local governments, 
would also have relative autonomy to begin to address the fundamental needs and the aspirations of the people who are resident uh, in their own uh, territories. And I think uh, it's very, very important. That's why good governance is also key, you know, because even if you bring resources to the states and the local governments under the present context of misgovernance and the poor leadership, uh, those resources will be frittered away and may not right. be impactful in terms of addressing the fundamental needs and aspirations of the people. So oh. there are substantial benefits okay, to be Professor gained Gaeta. in oh. terms of peace, in terms of stability, okay. in terms of uh, a stable socioeconomic development. Okay, okay Professor Jack, I will go for a quick break. We'll come back and we'll ask more questions. We'll be right back. Right, welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. We see our Professor Tyron Jager, former chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission. Uh, real quickly, Prof, uh, let, let's just go straight, straight to it. Uh, you have a timeline. You say over a couple of years the restructuring plan should be uh, over six, seven years. But I just want to quickly know, the first question will be the lowest hanging fruits. You know, between now and 2023, we can get from a restructured society and a country and secondly, the case of leadership too comes to play. Yes, we had sort of like a restructured system with a regional system all this well. But we saw what led to the military taking over. We remember the wet here, riots in the western region, in western Nigeria. Remember the fights between Awolawa and Akitola in this region and other fights across the region. How can we prevent that even if we restructure? Two questions, sir. Well, um, uh, uh, definitely um, it's possible to do quite a lot uh, of restructuring, focusing on what you call the low-hanging fruits between now and uh, 2023, uh, and then consolidate those with other uh, uh, reforms uh, 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 after 2023 until the next elections in 2027. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, once you do this, and we take measures to ensure that uh, post-2023, uh, we have substantially better uh, 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 elected leaders in governance, whether at the federal or at the state levels, uh, people who will respect democracy and who will be selfless in the ways in which they serve the people and manage the resources, and satisfy the needs and the aspirations of the people, uh, then obviously we would be able to avoid all those crises and conflicts and so on that you uh, have pointed out uh, in the First Republic. A lot of those had to do with not only authoritarian and selfish dispositions uh, of leaders, uh, but also uh, uh, issues of lack of respect and trust to differing uh, uh, opinions. And uh, under good governance and democratic uh, 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 governance, uh, obviously there should be a lot of tolerance, a lot of uh, mutual respect for each other, even if you have differing opinions, and uh, compliance, full compliance with the rule of law. Uh, in, the con in the present context, uh, we see situations in which at both the federal and state levels, uh, those entrusted with leadership positions do not comply or respect the rule of law. And if you don't comply or respect with the rule of law, you provide incentives for people to take laws into their hands. And that is a recipe for conflicts, for crises, and for violence. And uh, a lot of that also happened, uh, whether in the Western region or in other regions in the First Republic. So. Entrenching democratic culture and democratic practice with good leadership and good governance will avoid or minimize uh, all of this. But more specifically, the low hanging fruits that I see that we can address between now and 2023, some of them you can do them with uh, a, 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 a quick a, a constitutional amendment that is not wholesale, but that focuses on just that issue. And a lot of other things, particularly with regards to governance, can be done by 
the federal government, if there is a political will uh, in terms of uh, uh, addressing them and improving uh, the uh, process of governance. So, for example, I think that it is possible between now and 2023 for the federal government to set up a very small technical committee, but which is very broadly inclusive, uh, to be able to study the recommendations of the 2005 National uh, Political Reform Conference and the recommendations of the 2014 uh, National Conference and uh, be able to sort this out in terms of priority and then to be able to identify them in terms of uh, what should be addressed in the short and in the medium term. I think it's possible to do this uh, given the resources that we have in this country, intellectual resources, we should be able to get competent people from across the country that should be able to do this dispassionately within the shortest uh, possible time. Secondly, and most importantly, nobody can doubt the fact that the federal legislative list is unwieldy and concentrates too much power and authority and therefore commensurate resources to the federal government. We can talk about what brings this about. There are so many reasons. Obviously, the legacy of military rule and also its own uh, continuous impact uh, in the period of transition to democracy since 1999. But that is not the issue. The issue is if anybody who compares the Nigeria's federal legislative list with the federal legislative list in any federal country in the world will see the remarkable imbalance. So we should address that and begin to deconcentrate the power uh, uh, assigned to the federal government and allocate it to the state governments. And uh, doing so would also mean uh, uh, turning those resources uh, uh, associated with those responsibilities from the federal government to the state's uh, levels. So if we do that, you will find that the whole reason why uh, there is a lot of clamor for who controls the federal government is because who controls the federal government, particularly under our very terrible governance circumstances, is uh, they control also these resources and they vandalize them, privatize them, you know, and uh, 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 actually undermine, therefore, uh, uh, the sense of belonging by marginalizing others in real sense or even creating the perception of marginalization, which is even more serious and dangerous. So deconcentrate power and commensurate resources from the central government to the uh, 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 federating units or the states in our own context. And how do you do that? It's very simple. What is the best practice in all federal systems in the world? The best practice in all federal systems is that there are certain responsibilities that are the exclusive responsibilities of states or uh, the federating units. All the federal government needs to do is to create a, a regulatory framework, an incentive structure that can ensure equity and uh, respect for rule of law, as well as balanced development. So for example, why should the federal government uh, uh, have responsi responsibility in secondary and the basic education? You know, and you have a whole behemoth of a ministry uh, of Federal Ministry of Education, or Federal Ministry of Health, or Federal Ministry of Housing, you know, or Federal Ministry of Works. These are unnecessary in a federal system. The resources should be channeled to the states, you know, so that the states can handle these responsibilities because these are what directly affect the needs and the aspirations uh, of the people. And I think this is something that can be done between now and 20. Uh, 23. Now, of course, the challenge is that uh, uh, you have to ensure that there is a good governance framework at the state level to ensure that these resources are not commandeered by reckless governors uh, or reckless uh, chairmen of uh, uh, local governments uh, to divert them into personal use through 
uh, corruption and prevandalism. So, but that will be a challenge that I believe once there are a lot of resources uh, uh, at the state level, the attention of the local elite will now focus in terms of how those resources are managed, how they are utilized, and how they become beneficial uh, to our uh, citizens. And which means that all citizens, therefore, you know, have to be mobilized and engaged in terms of ensuring uh, appropriate utilization of these uh, resources. So that's, for me, a low-hanging fruit that can, be, can have substantive impact in terms of uh, uh, reducing all this uh, focus uh, at the federal level and all this competition for resources, and in fact, all this tendency for those who control federal uh, government to begin to convert those resources into their own uh, selfish and personal uses to the disadvantage of, of others. So I think this is something that is doable, that is practical, that is much, much easier than trying to create new states or trying to go back to uh, the original four regions in 1960 to 66, or even in creating a new uh, regional structure on the basis of the so-called six geopolitical zones. And by doing so, all this argument about how some of the 36 states in the Federation are unviable uh, economically will be addressed because the more resources that come to these states, the more viable they will become, particularly uh, if now there are efforts to ensure that these resources are not appropriately vandalized. Well, prof, and one low-hanging report in the area of governance that can also facilitate this, that can be done immediately, is to also now begin to strengthen the anti-corruption fight particularly at the state and local government levels. Well, We've been prof. focusing on celebrated cases, particularly at the federal level. If we can now focus on the state level and ensure that uh, people who steal public funds are dealt with uh, and penalized appropriately, we will begin to also create that environment in which when more resources come, they can be uh, uh, handled much better than they are being handled well, now. Well, Prof, if I may but just come in here. also very, very important. Prof, if I may just come in here. We have yeah. just about three minutes to go, and I have a pack of uh, questions for you very quickly. Well, I mean, the, your paper <laughs> underwent to restructure. talks about short-term measures, medium-term steps, and long-term steps. Uh, but some of those steps that you've talked about, we've tried them before. What is the guarantee that it will work now? You, in your conclusion, you talked about elite consensus. How do we build that elite or national consensus, as you call it? Even yesterday, uh, there was no consensus. The only consensus was everybody talking about restructuring. Second, I mean, are you running for president in 2023 to give you an opportunity to uh, put some of these ideas into practice? And finally, what do you say to the response from the presidency? that whoever wants restructuring should go and approach the National Assembly, which has a committee on constitutional review. And the spokesperson of the Senate says, all the people talking about uh, restructuring, they are just sloganeering. If they have anything to say, they should approach the legislature. Quickly. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I don't think that it's uh, helpful uh, for the federal government to take that position. I think in this kind of uh, a desire to improve federal arrangement, uh, the federal government needs to play a critical role, a proactive role, in order to bring positive changes in this country. So sitting back and saying go to the National Assembly, I think is unhelpful. I think there is a lot that the, the, the federal government can do. This thing that I suggested about a small technical group that can synthesize the uh, uh, recommendations of the two major national uh, conferences that we had uh, can only be done by a federal authority, not by the legislature or anybody. So, so really, uh, I don't think that's the right approach, and I hope the federal government will review its position in this regard. Secondly, in 2023, I want for Nigeria the best competent, experienced, 
group of leaders at both the federal and the state level that can help us have good democratic governance for national development, for the management of our diversity, and for our progress and development as a nation. And in a country of 250, uh, or at least 200 million people, if we look carefully, if we improve the selection criteria for leadership within political parties, we can find these people. So my joining politics and my critical engagement now is to help those young men and women in this country that are losing hope, to regain hope and to become engaged, because that is the only way for us to be able to find the requisite leadership uh, cadres that we need at both federal and state levels to drive our progress and development post-2023. So the issue of contesting for a public office really is not in my mind as I speak with you. And uh, uh, all I want is everybody has to be involved. We can no longer sit on the fence. We need to mobilize people. We need to conscientize them. We need to get them to come out, participate in the electoral process, in the political uh, processes, and ensure that uh, the right kind of people that we need, given our resources in this country, uh, actually are filled with better quality people than the ones that are in charge right now. And I think all of us have a responsibility uh, 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 to do that. Um, now, with regards to all of these things being tried before, I can tell you the difference from what I'm saying. You know, the, 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 all of this have been tried before under a wrong framework, under a framework that is undemocratic, that is authoritarian, uh, even in the period when we said we are transitioning to democracy, and under very, very poor leadership at both the federal and in most of the, as, at the state level. You know? So that's why I think that uh, 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 restructuring is necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition for both stability and for progress in Nigeria. And that's why we have to combine all these with uh, uh, reforms in governance. Low-hanging fruits in the governance pair. For example, the cost of governance. This is something by a presidential uh, order uh, or directive can be addressed, particularly at the federal level. Look at the expenditures that are wasted in overheads. You know, I have been a chief executive of an electoral commission. I have related at that time with many federal agencies, and I could see the West, you know, and uh, of course that West is, is West of public resources, but it's avenue for corruption for many public officers. We can address that. Look at the resources we spend on foreign trips, on uh, uh, Estacord, and a lot of other things, or even entertainment uh, uh, in, in offices. Thank this you, is Prof. something that can be addressed. If Thank there you, is a political will by, 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 by the, those who are holding executive a political positions. Will. On so that there is note, a lot we, like we can do, really, you, if we focus our minds to it between now and 2023. 20, uh, well, uh, thank, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much uh, Professor Jagar, for joining us. We wish, you know, uh, the conversation could continue, but we have to move on at this point.